So we have a number of topics that we're going to talk about today, but the first one is aging. Uh, both of you have worked and spoken a great deal on aging, and we all grow up feeling intuitively that aging is this inevitable process. And at the same time, we do this crazy thing that you can have a 30-year-old woman and a 30-year-old man, and somehow they come together and create a zero-year-old person, which is kind of crazy when, when you think about it. So first question for both of you is, is aging inevitable? And is it reversible? Maybe starting with you, Liz. Well, I think you answered the question right away, mm -hmm. which is that when you think about our germ cells, that are the cells that, you know, from generation to generation produce amazing new babies, then clearly this um, immortal lineage can happen. And I think when we figure that out, and there's a lot of research that points towards why these cells do so well, how they preserve their genome so well, how they clean up their proteins so well, then we've got mechanisms there. Now, there's a lot of things we have to take care of if we're going to also play that out in the very complex system of our, our human bodies with its, you know, trillions of cells, not to mention its microbiome in there to coexist with and, uh, and the uh, changes that happen to the DNA and its expression as we, as we age. But, but it's... Um, not inevitable. We are sort of an accident of evolution, really, that we happen to have the lifespans that we do. And we're a giant experiment on the planet because until very recent history, we never really, mostly as a species, lived into extreme old age. So, so we're just, you know, we're, we're a big experiment of 7.5 billion souls <laughs> and going on as, as, we, as we speak. Yeah, and so George, you, you have famously said that we're on the verge of the beginning of age reversal, something that I've written about as well. What do you mean by that and how close are we? Well, part of it's very pragmatic. It's easier to do experiments where the time horizon is five weeks than 50 years. Uh, to get FDA approval, it's easier. Aging reversal is not science fiction. It's, it hap it, we, we have many examples, not just the example of reversal when we procreate, but we can do that, we can reprogram my 63-year-old fibroblasts into stem cells with four transcription factors. Um, Shinya Yamanaka and his team have, have made those quite famous. And you can not only do that in, in cell culture, you can do it in animals as well. Plus, and there are many other examples of aging reversal that are well documented in animals um, where you can get uh, factors from the blood uh, that we're uh, characterizing more and more. Um, uh, there are even small molecules that have been discovered from, from many different ways, including observing the effects of small molecule drugs on diabetics and seeing the off-label off, uh, uh, advances that occur with that, like, like metformin, like metformin and rapamycin. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk now about some of these, of these mechanisms of aging that you have um, been uh, referring to. So... Liz, your Nobel Prize was in understanding telomeres. Just give us uh, the audience a little bit of background about what are telomeres and why are they important for aging? Well, our, gen our genes are housed in chromosomes, little tiny bodies inside every cell, but they have a lot of genetic material in them. And at the very ends of the chromosomes, we think of it, if you think of a shoelace and think of the chromosome as a shoelace, it's like this little protective tip at the end that stops the shoelace end fraying away. And we know a lot about the mo molecular nature of that. And the bottom line is that when that telomeric uh, end wears down, that sends a tremendous signal to a cell that says, oops, you know, genetic material in danger, and the cell sends off alarm signals and won't work properly as a cell, bottom line. That turns out in the long trajectories of decades of human life to start to happen in our lives, that that wearing down really does happen. And there's consequences which have been <clears throat> proven genetically, you know, lots of different ways that this is a contributor uh, to things like very common diseases of mortality, that cause mortality, cardiovascular. If you have a certain set of variants that change your telomere maintenance, and this was just found by objectively looking across the genome, you start out of the gate with about a 20% higher chance of getting cardiovascular disease of various kinds. So genes that maintain your telomeres matter and how they maintained matters. And it turned out that that was very interesting because there was a lot of life factors that change how well your telomeres are maintained. And, and I think very much connected with the talk 
we just heard, the marvelous talk about how important it is, our interactions, our connectedness, we found over and over again, and many others too, so this is not just you know, my, I and my collaborators, many have found that the more connected you are, the more social support, the more rich your family relationships, the more, the more um, you trust your neighborhood, those things all quantifiably related to better telomere maintenance. So your mind is having real physiological readouts that have health-related effects. So there's a very interesting cyclical nature yeah, and, to, to all of this. And it's very interesting because in the early days of when your research was coming out, it was identified that telomerase would extend yes, people's yes. telomeres. And so everybody, my mother called yes. me and said, where do I get yeah, telomerase? Get my jug of telomerase, yeah, Exactly, right? and, and <laughs> right. every other life-extending <laughs> yes. thing my mother, my yes, mother reads yes. about, she calls. Um, but then it turned out that that was actually quite dangerous. And so the yes. application, right. as, you, as you mentioned, yeah. were things that are very intuitive of how to live a life where you feel safe, how to live a life where you are reducing the amount of stress on your body. So George, um, moving to other mechanisms, you mentioned the Yamanaka factors. So as you mentioned, Shinya Yamanaka won the 2012 Nobel Prize for identifying these four factors that create what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. So an adult cell can become a stem cell. Talk, and then there have been some recent papers about how to use those Yamanaka factors to reverse age mice. Um, yep. Maybe talk a little bit about that uh, and, and about parabiosis, the, the, the research that's been done connecting an old mouse and a young mouse and looking how the young mouse gets older and the old mouse gets younger. Right. So. Uh these are among many that, that both the, in, that have been well established in animals, uh, worms, flies, and mice mainly, where you can either get longevity, where, where from birth they have the right genes, or there are, there are a smaller subset of experiments where you actually reverse it during their lifetime, mm -hmm. including the Yamanaka factors and the, and the, uh, right. and the blood uh, components. Uh, if you look, there's, about, there's a database of hundreds of, of these genes that have been well curated, and what we're doing is um, turning them into gene therapies. So these, this is a very, way of, a very good way of doing both rapid prototyping, but also possibly a mature uh, therapy. There are now 2,400 gene therapies in clinical trials, and it's very easy to go from a hypothesis from the literature to a gene therapy, we, we can do 60 at once with just a couple of postdocs. And, and, and so we take pre-aged mice that are two years old, and then the gene therapies that work in those, we move into um, pre-aged dogs, um, 12 years old, and we're looking for uh, things that will have an effect there. But it's, we're looking for something that has a, a body-wide physiological impact. And Liz, you were saying yeah, yeah. earlier that you were just with Tony weiss Carre talking about parab uh, parabiosis and how that's... Yes. Maybe give your thoughts on parabiosis, which again is this, uh, it's done in different ways, but sewing these two mice together. Um, what are the implications of that and where is right. it going? Well, that was kind of the original way of doing it. Now the question was, what was it in right. that uh, you know, blood that exchanged between the animals? And so now, of course, people are narrowing in and there are indeed protein factors that are being seen. Perhaps it's going to be a combination of them, but that are being seen to be part of this. So I think you won't need to have your, uh, you know, blood donor, as we rather grotesquely talked about mm -hmm. yesterday. You know, blood you boy your from blood. the Silicon Valley <laughs> TV show. Yeah. Right. But in fact, you know, like so many of these things that start off with a mixture of, uh, you know, very complex mixture of what's in the blood, it really looks as if these are soluble protein factors that eventually probably one will be able to find optimal cocktails. It mightn't take care of every aspect of aging. You know, one of the fascinating things about aging is that there are proteins the very same molecules can sit in your brain or your heart, it seems like, you know, for life, and not get um, fixed when they get damaged. And so, and yet there are other cells that are really good at uh, turning over, as we say, as replacing damaged proteins. So, you know, persuading cells to turn on these pathways mm -hmm. so they could fix, you know, you know, replace their old worn down proteins. I call them zombie proteins. Mm -hmm. They're the undead. They sit there, you know, and they're damaged and you want them to go away. So, so there's going to be different aspects. As George says, the reprogramming is certainly one way because that sets things back into a more young state 
including, by the way, improving their telomere maintenance. We've right. seen that happening because that's a kind of given. You have to take care of that before all the other parts will be taken care of. Yeah, and, and it's, and so, it's very interesting because with, with this, you're right, they're identifying what are the factors that have this yes, rejuvenating yes, impact. Yes. And first they were connecting these uh, different mice, and then they were injecting human cord blood into the old mice, and those yes, old mice yes. also started to get, to get right. younger. So they're sort of cross-species, yeah. cons conserved right. mechanisms, which says then that the research on the mouse models right. the, you know, will be very helpful yeah. up, to, up to a point. And so um, I, I think that, you know, but there might be multiple aspects of aging that right. one has to take care of. And, and, and I think we have to think, you know, how long do we want to be, um, you know, living these kinds of, this arc of our lives. Right. I think that's a huge question that yeah. many people really kind of grapple with and comes to, you know, well, what is a fulfilling worthwhile right. life and which years do you extend? Right. Somebody said, please, not the teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take anything I can get. But uh, George, you've been doing a lot studying uh, centenarians, long-lived humans, and long-lived animals. What would you say are the, the big lessons and how to, uh, from the, studying them? And how does that lead to a uh, path forward? Well, certainly there are environmental components, but one can't help but be struck by the fact that, that mice live about two years and bowhead whales live about 200 years. Right. Um, that's probably not what school they went to or other environmental <laughs> factors. Uh, or and and, and there, are, there are human beings that, that, that have exceeded 110, 120 years, right. and they are very, very youthful um, at that right. age. And the hope is that if we can figure out what the components they have, which um, we can, like with the, just as with the parabiotic mm -hmm. blood components, we can try them in various combinations and various ratios to, to improve on um, what, what we've already observed in nature. And it might be very different from, you know, we sort of attempted by the idea there might be one pathway to success. Right. But um, I'm struck by another species or a pair of species. They're called mole rats and mm. they, they live, you know, many, many decades and they're very social and people have studied them. And they don't die of cancer, but they live for very long ages. Yeah. And so people were very excited and said, what's their secret? And so there's a certain mechanism in one species, but another species that does the same thing. It seems like they avoid cancer in a different way. Yeah. And yet they also live long. So I think we have to maybe think about, maybe the success we see in people is not converging on one thing, just well, like- I sincerely and, hope so, because that gives <laughs> us a chance to yeah. put them all together. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, and, but, but there may be certain ones in certain settings that are more yeah. you know, powerful than right. others. Yeah. So there's a lot to learn about <clears throat> these really right. complex systems, which is why we need the technologies yeah to get us past you know, this immense complexity right. that is, yeah. that is life. And, and it's just a, a short commercial, ho uh, commercial message for our host, the Google Calico has one of the largest colonies of naked mole rats for exactly right. the right. reason of, of No, no, of they're, favorite, they're the favorite yeah. species now, but I think one needs to look at some of the other yeah. mole rats too, yeah, yeah. because their secrets are not the same ones as the... the right, and I think your, your point about that we're not just one big thing, it's, there's not one intervention, connects to something that you've been writing and, and and thinking and speaking a lot about, which is what you call a precision interception. We all yes. know about precision yes. medicine, personalized medicine, but what you're saying is let's move forward in the time frame. Don't wait until somebody gets sick. Let's exactly. figure out what to look for and how to keep them healthy. Yes, why wait for the sword to fall on your head? Right. Say, oh, I've got cancer. Well, cancer doesn't happen overnight. It happens, it develops over years, as do you know some of the other major killers like cardiovascular diabetes. So more and more biology is being learned about the earliest stages. So this can be made very scientific. And I like to use the word interception because it's a, a continuum uh, of, you know, there can be very early stages which are not particularly, um, you know, malign, but uh, can be averted. So, you know, you want to intercept processes before they take hold and start to really right. become pathological. And this is getting more and more realistic because you can capture, I think, more and more data right. about what's going on early and put together uh, what, what is happening, and right. then say, aha, now for this person, this interception makes sense, but for another right. person, another one yeah. uh, might make better. And as, as we were talking about yesterday, I think what that leads to is our need to have, in some ways, a much greater sensing environment, environment yes. that is, is reading yes. us. I mean, I write science fiction so I can make things up, 
Um, but I like the idea someday of my bathroom being a sensor, that my mirror is watching me, it's looking for changes. Uh, the, the toilet where you're flushing all kinds of useful information down the toilet every day. Your microbiome. Should be, yeah, it should be gathering data <laughs> yes, and then yes. communicating with yes. your, your smoothie yes. maker in your yes. kitchen to say, hey, this person needs a little extra iron, this person <laughs> needs this or that. And it's, it, it sounds crazy, but it kind of no, makes no, sense. We have all these technologies yeah. today. It, and how about internally? I love the idea. Yeah. Of things cruising around and little tiny things saying, "How's your telomeres in these tissues?" You know, a little, little yeah, yeah. kind of you know nudge upwards, uh, get rid of a few cells that are getting a little cancerous yeah, it's here. Yeah, Ray Kurzweil's you know, nanobots. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah. no, I, I think that um, if we, and this is not totally science yeah. fiction, but I think yeah. if we could really scrutinize what's going on within yeah. us systemically in, in these non-invasive uh, ways, using you know. F f Pico, Pico, um, Pico science, you know, right. and nanoscience is yeah. probably too big. You probably may have to go even smaller. Yeah, and that's this crazy thing is that science fiction and science fact are just so overlapping. We just, you don't even need to talk about science fiction. You just talk about where we are and where we're going, and it's just, it blows people's mind, which, uh, George, a lot of people are talking these days in, uh, about CRISPR. What, what are the, the short-term and medium-term uh, applications of CRISPR? And you've said uh, repeatedly that CRISPR is just one tool, and there are more tools that are going to allow us to be much more uh, precise in our, in our gene editing. Right, so uh, to some extent, CRISPR, uh, let's start with its flaws. Uh, it, it is a serial killer, naturally. That's what it does, is it kills viruses in nature by scanning along the genome, looking for anything that's that they recognize as, as some bad guy they've seen before. And they do that with about 20 base pairs of, of RNA as the main recognition element. Uh, so that, that one of its limitations is it just cuts. It doesn't do the precise editing that we would all like. Um, there are other enzymes that do that, and it's just a matter of time before they displace it. It also is inefficient. That is to say, typically when you treat something with CRISPR, you get a mosaic a mixture of different outcomes. Some are unaffected, some are affected in one way, some are affected in another way. You get this mosaic, and there's also alternatives for that as well. So that we can look forward to that on the very near horizon. Most of these technologies get turned over about every four or five years. Um, Needless, nevertheless, that, that there are very powerful things that can be done with it. I mentioned there's 2,400 gene therapies that are in clinical trials. Most of those are not gene editing, but we will see many more. And, and that includes anything where you want to knock something out, where the, where the, the trouble is due to an excess of something or, or a, a false version of something. All the other gene therapies are about adding. This is about subtraction. And then finally, there will be the precise editing um, in, the, in the future. We can use it for um, making transplantable organs from pigs. We can do it for you know, public health efforts on, on um, using mosquitoes and, and, uh, and mice and other vectors of disease. There are um, agricultural applications as well. Yeah. Right. I think we I think, and, and I think that just standing from here, recognizing just the tools that we have now, if we had no new tools, we could revolutionize ourselves in the world. When we think of that the tools themselves are on an exponential curve, so even <clears throat> that we will be able to do things in the not distant future that are unimaginable today. And this, of course, raises a lot of big issues. The fact that we will have tools that will allow us um, to recode life um, doesn't mean that we will have the emotional, intellectual, other kinds of maturity and wisdom as a species to smartly apply those um, uh, apply those those tools in a way that does more good than more uh, than more harm. There was a time in uh, in 2005 when the UN General Assembly had a resolution. At that time, they were talking about cloning, and they were saying, "Well, the human germline is sacred. Uh, the germline is your inherited inheritable uh, DNA." Um, but now, with mitochondrial transfer and other things, uh, that issue of is the human uh, germline sacred is really uh, coming in, into question. George, what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, the National Academy of Sciences had a very well-researched document, took about two-plus years, just came out this February, that, that uh, came out with a slightly different conclusion, which is that there are medical reasons why you might uh, intervene with germline. Uh, 
for example, there's a, a large set of diseases, about 5% of children are born with very severe genetic diseases that are very impactful uh, psychosocially and economically, up to $20 million of the lifetime cost. And those can be, uh, some, those can be handled um, uh, right now. They're the medical, uh, main medical way that they're handled is through abortion. That's not acceptable mm -hmm. to everybody. This may provide another way of engineering the sperm or eggs so that, um, so that you can completely avoid um, risk to embryos for this 5% yeah. of the population. You mentioned uh, engineering sperm and eggs. You didn't mention engineering embryos. Right. Yes. Uh, and part of that is because that, that doesn't save embryos, that put embryos at risk. And also, so far, that's uh, producing mosaic uh, embryos. While with you deal with precursor cells, we've shown this in some other labs too, you can get essentially 100% what you want um, by screening the, the clones before you put them in to replace the, um, the cells. And part of that suggests um, that we're going to move towards IVF and embryo screening just because so much is happening outside of the, outside of the traditional um, body. How do you see reproduction, Liz, evolving in light of these technological revolutions that we've been discussing? Well, I think, I think there is the, the what is the doable, and then also really understanding that, you know, although our genes are very important, it's a little bit of the light under the lamppost. We understand them best. There's a lot of other things that do yeah. go on. Our epigenome, which is the chemical decorations all over the genes that make genes come on and off, and that's quite changeable throughout life. There's some data beginning that it might be partly heritable. So I, I think we... Um, you, you know, we might, except for the cases George is talking about, where, where clearly a medical need can be met by correcting, you know, a defective gene, a gene that's mutated in some way that will really cause harm. But beyond that, in terms of trying to nuance the predictable outcomes, what does the genome predict in terms of the full life of a person? We're, we're really only partly there. Now, this may start to get more and more understood as one gets lots of data on lots of individuals of their genomes, their epigenomes, their cellular systems, because how those play out is in itself a whole world. And you can have, for example, just genetically identical yeast cells, and they normally divide about 25 times. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at individual ones, some will just explode with a catastrophic problem after six divisions. Some will explode after 40. They're genetically the same. They're identical. Right. What happened with that system's failure, I think, is a marvelous, probably approachable question yeah. with um, better t tools. But we need to understand the systems better before we yeah. make too many inroads into things that are not just right. um, curative. And that's absolutely so, because the, the yeah. level of complexity is, yes. is monumental. And this is the yes. ultimate big data problem. But as we move towards yes. precision medicine, as you've mentioned, and everybody will have their sequence genome as the foundation of their electronic medical record, and we'll be able to compare the genotype and the other um, body systems and what they say and the phenotype and how they are expressed over time, Potentially, yeah. we'll know we'll know right. more. And what more can more. we learn from each right. other? I think we'll learn a lot about human diversity. Yeah. You know, we have millions of base pair changes yeah. among us all, and yeah. yet somehow the system works in this very compensated, fascinating way that can adapt. And so, right. there's, there's, you know, we are we are surely incredibly interesting creatures. Things on Earth, yeah. life on yeah. Earth is really, really yeah. well worth that yeah. intellectual um, yeah. effort going into it because it'll not only help us, but I think you know it's sort of. It, and expands our horizon. Absolutely, and it's, uh, this is all very exciting to people, and I think all of us speak to people about this uh, all the time, but it also scares people. And how do we find um, the balance between yeah. making people, yeah. helping people understand this incredible promise and not scaring people so much that they don't feel that this science and this future is about them, George? Well, a lot of it has to do with constant communication, um, and to some extent, they should they should be scared occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's 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 good to have it so that you think about it in advance and to bring right. things up that uh, that might be uh, worthy of protecting ourselves from them. Right. Uh, in the end, usually it is about safety and efficacy, but there are some other issues as well that. 
that are beyond the purview of the FDA that we can talk about in advance. And, and we can think about when there are harms, how, how do we deal with harms right. as a society? You know, one mechanism is, is you know, there's, there's, there's rules, there's laws, there's understood modes of behavior. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have to face that there are, there are things that we probably do. You, you know, we don't condone murder, right? right? I mean, even though that's extremely possible, <laughs> right, yeah. to do it. And so, so there are things that we probably, as a society, will start thinking about. But... Um, but it's all mixed in, as you said, with sort of fear of the unknown, which right. can be holding things back in ways that yeah. are not good. And so I think it comes back to we really have to start understanding and asking ourselves what is it that is, you know, what is it that makes lives fulfilling and worthwhile right. and our interactions with others? It's, it's interesting, yeah. sort of puts us right back to some really yeah. fundamental, fundamental questions. Yeah, yeah. That and, and I think that's the challenge uh, with all this, is that the technology is new, but the wisdom and the values that we will need to make sense of it is, are in many ways yeah. old. But, but we can respect that. Yeah, I think, if we, they're I think old. we must. I think we <laughs> right. must. I mean, the challenge <laughs> is that the technology is advanced, advancing exponentially. Public understanding is advancing linearly. And the regulatory structures to make sure that people feel comfortable where everything is going are only inching, inching forward glacially. And yes. um, thank you so much.